Uh, so welcome to the How to Build the Effective Research Support session. And I would like to invite now our colleague from the Center for Development Evaluation of Social Science, Amela Kurta, uh, to give a presentation on benefits of open research infrastructure for early career social science researchers. Amela, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Angela. As Angela said, I'm coming from the Center for Development, Evaluation, and Social Science Research, uh, which is based in Sarajevo in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And I will be talking um, something different from the first session. Uh, it will be uh, more from the perspective of the research infrastructure and the researchers themselves than the, from the perspective of the managers. So what is needed from uh, the uh, research infrastructure to be developed for the researchers, and in particularly for the researchers in the social sciences. Uh, so uh, at the very beginning, I will just highlight some benefits of the open research infrastructure, uh, and would like to present you uh, an environment in uh, my country, which we are facing with, uh, and why we decided, and what motivate us to open our research infrastructure uh, towards the community and our end users. And uh, I will present also to uh, specific departments and tools that we uh, developed uh, to support our um, early career researchers. Uh, so I don't have to uh, tell you because all of you have a lot of experience in the research management that uh, open access research infrastructure has numerous benefits among them is better efficiency and use of existing resources. It is worth nothing or it is worth less if we have resources in terms of data, equipment, uh, tools, expertise, which is sealed within one institution and a limited number of researchers can access it and use it. If we open our research infrastructure and if we open, for example, university lab laboratories and um, pieces of um, and parts of our institutions, we can uh, build more effective um, and uh, we can use existing resources to be more uh, efficient in conducting research. Uh, also from the perspective of the institution, uh, why uh, it is important to be open is because by being open, we can attract more financial investments in terms of the collaboration between the academia and industry, which is now a sexy topic when we talk about uh, at the European level. Uh, also, uh, from the perspective of the researchers and uh, early career researchers, uh, opening up the research infrastructure uh, enables them and uh, to, uh, to have a greater research mobility and that is what is, I think, the most important uh, when we look at the Western Balkans region. Uh, so we need this cross-border cooperation to be more uh, frequent and also to provide an environment for the researchers so they can proceed and develop their career um, to the greater extent. Okay, uh, so when we started to think about opening uh, our research infrastructure, so uh, my institution is in social science research, uh, and we are independent and non-profit organization, and we wanted to be open to the wider community. Uh, we got, uh, while doing the research and communicating with our community, um, usual beliefs or obstacles that the researchers are facing with is, for example, data are not available, conducting the research is too expensive for our budgets, we don't have specific research skills or the skills and expertise is somewhere at the, uh, not in our country, so maybe at the West, for example. And then we realize that the research infrastructure in, is needed. In addition to that, we also conduct a survey among uh, our partner universities uh, about their practices in data preservation and sharing. And what we found is that, unfortunately, we are still at this traditional way of doing research where the data are collected, primary data are collected and kept by the researchers themselves. So imagine how the tremendous loss we have because the data are not shared and because we seal them 
uh, by the one single researcher and uh, nobody can access it and use it again. So uh, when the researchers and early career researchers come to us, uh, we try to break these uh, to, to break these paradigms and to teach them that uh, they don't need to collect primary data if the secondary data are available and they can be uh, used and can serve the purpose of for the, their own research. Also, that they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So, uh, unfortunately, we got a reflection even from the uh, super PhD supervisors at the university, that the students have, have to collect primary data and have to develop their own models and their own theory. You don't have to. And we try to teach them that uh, using the secondary data and using the already developed tools and techniques is scientifically valid and you can provide scientific uh, contribution even by doing uh, this in this way. Also, they, uh, when they come in touch with us and uh, see the benefits of the open research infrastructure, they see that the research can be done less costly with better quality, and we also try to achieve that the research is policy relevant, and I think that in the Western Balkans region, we are missing this. So to have the policy relevant research uh, and not and the research results not to be sealed within the, uh, just the academia, just the uh, academic community. So, as I told you, this presentation is something different from the beginning ones. So, uh, my institution, so the Center for Development, Evaluation and Social Science Research, uh, acronym CREDI, uh, after uh, we realized that we have um, characteristics of the open research infrastructure, we decided to publish uh, this and make it visible to our community by developing the open access policy and it was developed uh, with the support of the Regional Cooperation Council support program uh, in 2020. Uh, what was the, uh, before we um, uh, open our, our research infrastructure to the community uh, is that we uh, joined ESS, ERIC, SES, ERIC, and Open Air, and also we um, coordinate and gather around uh, universities in our country. Uh, currently, we have 13 universities in our uh, national network. Uh, where we collaborate and communicate with all of them uh, to support researchers uh, in doing research, but also in other uh, in uh, in administration of the research, uh, writing proposals, applying for funds, uh, and uh, so uh, the, the whole process. Uh, this is just a br uh, briefly how the research infrastructure at CREDI uh, is uh, developed. So it is around the data archive research tools and research outputs. And I will just skip to the two things. I will focus on two things. This is the data archive and the inquire uh, evidence the policy hub. So the data archive uh, is particularly important for the early career researchers for them to find the data which is the, our food. So for the social sciences, the data are the, uh, their food. Uh, currently, uh, our archive has over 50 data sets for usage, uh, and our data catalog can be accessed online. We provide data under the FAIR principles. We are the partner institution of CESDA, and what I'm uh, the most proud of is that in the situation where we didn't have a, a data archive three years ago, we are now uh, just recently received the Core Trust Seal certification, which is the highest possible standard in providing uh, and disseminating data in social sciences. Uh, and uh, we are the only data archive as a digital repository certified against these standards in the Western Balkan region. Uh, so uh, for the, the social science researchers, uh, this is uh, important because they know that we are trustworthy digital repository, that data are kept according to the highest possible standards and are provided under the FAIR principles so that everybody can access it and use it for its own purposes if, uh, 
it is the research purpose. Uh, okay, the second thing which uh, we uh, provide to the early career researchers is Inquire Evidence to Policy Hub, where we have research incubator support program for students uh, to teach them how these open uh, uh, science practices are important and how they can uh, develop their research plan and research methodology to be uh, valid and to be relevant uh, for the uh, for policy making. Uh, we do this in cooperation with our uh, network of universities and we use the diaspora potential uh, in this program in terms that our mentors are uh, from our diaspora uh, because they know um, environment and can communicate with the researchers more uh, in a more efficient way. And also we have Youth Policy Hub which uh, is provide cooperation with public institutions, advocacy organizations and funders uh, in order for um, researchers to achieve uh, impact and policy relevant research and to be visible uh, uh, to, to the, not among just academia, but also uh, in a wider community. Uh, and what I want to say is just at the end is that uh, as I said, we are independent and non-profit institution, and until now, we re for, the, for example, for the development of the data archive, we received support from CESDA, uh, from the, um, their mentorship program, and also Fairest Fair support program, which is also a CESDA program, but unfortunately, no government support until now. Uh, so I think that um, we have to speak even more frequently at the regional level about uh, things like the support to the researchers, uh, about the open science and open access, and also what is meant by the quality assurance, validity and relevance of the research in terms of not just the impact within the academia, but also uh, for the, the wider community, for, for the citizens and uh, for the uh, development of our countries and our region. Uh, so when we look, uh, opening up research infrastructure is lowering down the cost of conducting research, but still this uh, provides better quality and you should think about uh, if you have a research infrastructure to go open uh, because it brings more benefits to all of us and research can be done less costly but with better quality. So thank you very much. If you have any question, I will, I'm just waiting for them. Thank you. Uh, so now I would like to invite Andre Daniel uh, from TSUNY European Center to tell us more about the support for the EC funded research projects at, at Charles University. Welcome, Andre. Thanks so much for having me here, and I'll try to put the presentation on. On yes, Malay. I'll try. Okay, so I think the time is valuable, and uh, I have the presentation somewhere, but where? Nobody knows. So no, that's, no, no. that's the life. All oh, right. Okay, I should have. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> Fine. Okay, so I'll, I'll introduce myself in the meantime. So, for having closed the presentation, which was the right one, and okay, <laughs> didn't get it. But, uh, now, okay, I'll, I'll present myself. I'm working as a um, research support manager, as most of you, uh, at the Charles University, uh, which is based in Prague, Czech Republic. Okay, there am I. Wonderful. And I have a tricky name. Uh, people call me Daniel, but it's my family name, right? So I, my first name is Andrzej, Andrew, Andrea, Ondraš, and so on. So it's, that's my name. And uh, um, bam, bam, next slide, so this is how you can see, the, I'm working at Rectorate basically, uh, which is in the city center of, of, of Prague, and we are, uh, among other, we are doing the support for the EC-funded projects, which I'll be, I'll be uh, 
presenting right now. So basically, our European Center is um, tries to cover, um, let's say, the pre-award uh, uh, services for the for the researchers. Uh, at the whole, so we are at the Charles University, there are 17 faculties and uh, basically we are specializing in the health sector uh, as well as in the social sciences, humanities and uh, uh, some parts of the, of the uh, technological sciences also. So this is, this is, uh, this is these are our anchors, you could say. And in the same time, um, we tried so to, well, the European Center is uh, on the central level and it, it is uh, basically working for, for several years now, trying to, um, let's say, make or provide uh, a uh, service for all those faculties. So this is something which, is, uh, which has to be underlined. Since uh, most of these faculties are, um, yeah, working in different fields, I have different experiences uh, with, with uh, easy funded projects. Uh, it is, uh, some, 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 sometimes it can be a task. But uh, we have tried to cope with that also uh, by, uh, let's say, developing the projects on our own, uh, which is a way how to, how to do that. And uh, uh, I, will be, I will be presenting one of them, um, which is, uh, um, let's say, the support for, well, I'll be pre presenting three, three activities. The first one is the support for the so-called ERC projects of the European Research Council, uh, which uh, are usually understood as a kind of a cherry on the cake of the European uh, funded projects. Uh, we have been somehow successful in the, in the past uh, by developing some, some, some sort of support uh, in the, in, let's say, in, in a collective aim together with the, with the Academy of Sciences by creating, uh, this is what we call a PRC pipeline. Basically, the researchers uh, who are interested in uh, um, well, those types of grants, uh, which are very personal and very, let's say, individual, but still big, uh, big, big budget-wise, uh, they, are, they are asked to uh, pre-submit a kind of proposal to the central office, uh, where we try to uh, mentor them and work uh, with them in order that they achieve, uh, well, yeah, let's say, higher possibilities of success. So there is an ex expert group which is created uh, based on that between the Charles University and uh, the Academy of Sciences, and we try to work also very closely with the national contact points, uh, um, and okay, the success is uh, getting little by little bigger and bigger, uh, but we are still counting, uh, let's say, until, until now at, uh, uh, at large in the Charles University, there are some 15 ERC grants, which is not, not so much, but okay, we are, let's say, it's steadily rising. So that's, that's, uh, that's uh, how we do it. And you can see that uh, in the last uh, call in 2021, okay, there was one, closed uh, last month, but uh, the, in uh, the one year before, uh, there were 21 proposals, and out of these 21 proposals, there were around three successful, so this is uh, something which is not, not, not so bad, um, given the overall statistics, right? So the second, uh, second kind of a big anchor of uh, the European Centre is that we are active in this, uh, I'm sure you're aware of the alliances, so this is the European Universities uh, well, alliance system. So uh, we are coupled with the universities of uh, Milano, Copenhagen, Sorbonne, uh, Warsaw, and uh, the University of Heidelberg. And uh, this is also, a, let's say, structure on itself, trying to, um, um, let's say, collaborate within, uh, within a, um, grant funding and uh, try, trying to provide another, another kind of uh, pers let's say funding uh, perspective into uh, the support of the individual problems uh, projects um, among these among these six different universities. So uh, currently, this is the second, uh, well, third year already, but the second year of uh, of uh, uh, of the mini grants, the so-called uh, system. There are some 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 20, 20 projects. Uh, Already, already uh, successful in this uh, say flagship uh, flagship thing, and uh, uh, okay. So as I said already, we are also applying for for the projects ourselves. So within this alliance, we have been successful in uh, in uh, um, with, a, with a let's say project proposal, uh, so called train for EU, trying to. Well, even more kind of align uh, different research support uh, activities within within these those uh, six universities, 
And uh, I personally, I'm, I'm working on uh, uh, research infrastructure, so this is something very close to what, what Amela was uh, um, presenting in, uh, in, her, in her talk just now. And um, we are, since we are having this profile very, um, very similar to uh, one, uh, let's say, we were, we were hearing from about, is uh, that uh, there is something uh, special, the social sciences and humanities, a sp kind of special support they need, because usually it is a, I could say this, this is, it's not even a field, but it is, um, let's say, a limitation of, uh, which is very, of, uh, of different disciplines, which is very heterogeneous. And um, they are, well, usually they are having certain problems of um, okay, not being so successful working with industrial partners, um, being some, some, sometimes in some disciplines uh, drawn back by, uh, let's say, kind of conservative mentalities of, of, the, of the researchers themselves. And uh, we try to provide some kind of specific support to these projects, since uh, we have, there are many of our faculties that, that focus on these topics. And we try to find, well, try to do, um, let's say, cert certain incentives in order uh, well, to, to promote the partnership uh, with the non-SSH uh, SSH, uh, organizations and also uh, trying to, let's say, uh, couple uh, our um, different project teams with the, with the experts from the NGOs. So this is something we are, we are trying to uh, do right now. It's, it's kind of fresh and if you would be interested, uh, there are definitely well, already some, some things to present. Uh, also, we remain open for any, any possibilities of collaboration, so if you would be uh, interested as there are my, my uh, contact details, so I'll be happy to um, either um, follow up with some questions or comments or we can continue the discussion uh, during, the, well, during the break or by the email. So thank you very much and this is it. Thank you for the presentation. My name is Bojan Vlaski. Vice Dean for Science Research and International Cooperation of the Faculty of Law, University of Banja Luka. Uh, because I work at the faculty, uh, I would like to hear uh, what are the capacities of the faculties at Charles Universities in regard to the research. Uh, you mentioned you cooperate with them. Do they have their own uh, departments uh, or uh, specific working positions? Thanks so much for, for this question. It's an important one, and it's uh, well. Usually, there is a um, um, administration also on the on the level of the faculties. In most of the faculties, there is something like a research support office also, but uh, their capacities uh, are very different according to the according to the different faculties, uh, and also let's say the knowledge of, uh, of the EC funded projects. So we try to somehow harmonize uh, and try to also couple uh, among them, yeah? So there is a, definitely those uh, who are uh, advanced, uh, they do not have any problem for asking for the, you know, for the European funded projects. Uh, but uh, for example, some of those in the humanities, they are only, let's say, little by little getting used to, yeah? So we are trying to make some kind of uh, inter, um, yeah, inter, like, discussion among the faculties themselves, trying to organize some trainings where all these faculties sit and try to share their experiences also. Yeah. So uh, I would like to now invite uh, Veronica Tamas uh, from Center for Social Sciences, Pathway to Success, Internationalization at Center for Social Sciences. Welcome everyone, uh, I am Veronica Tomasz from Center for Social Sciences and I would like to tell you a story of my institution and that pathway that we stepped on in 2012. Um, Center for Social Sciences, just very briefly, is uh, uh, <clears throat> was established in 2012 by the merge of four institutions that formerly existed under the uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences, Institute for Legal Studies, Institute for Sociology, uh, Minority Studies and Political Science. Uh, it was a great opportunity to merge these large fields of social sciences, but also a challenge for us. And, uh, you know, when I was invited to speak um, at this event, I was wondering why, because we do nothing special here. 
<laughs> and uh, when uh, I uh, wrote the annual report of my institution and created the statistics of publications, I saw this. So this was the beginning at 2012, and that is 2021. The number of uh, impact factor journal ar uh, articles have increased that much in my institution. Maybe it's not a big deal. Uh, we have 200 researchers, but it was a big <laughs> step for us. And regarding uh, uh, funding sources from international sources, we also, we also had an increase. Uh, we don't have all the readers for 2021, but we hope that column will be even higher. Um, so, so the initial state at 2012 was that the focus of the researchers at the institutions were, was domestic. They published in Hungarian journals, they published Hungarian books, and of course they applied for mainly Hungarian sources. There were only a few FP5, 6 and 7 projects, mainly the Hungarian case, so the best researchers were of course invited. But, uh, when Andreas Köröseni became the director general uh, of this newly created research center, uh, the main goal became internationalization, and uh, the goals were to increase the number of uh, international publications and projects. Uh, what we did and what had to be done, so uh, I, I, think, I think three, uh, three areas were important, like intention of leaders, motivation and support, and this is what I want to talk about. The clear and strong intention of leaders, I think this is the most important thing to achieve any goals in research management. Uh, we had three directors, generals, and uh, uh, they were very different personalities, but they shared that same intention that internationalization uh, should be done in the institution, and they did not hesitate to, uh, to provide funding sources uh, and, of course, the personal to this goal. Uh, how to internationalize ourselves. The first thought was that international publications are the first step because if we have more international publications, our international visibility will increase and of course we will invite it to more projects. And of course, when we have those projects, we will be able to uh, publish more publications, of course, because of the results of the project. So, um, we did many things, but first the ability uh, <laughs> should be there for the researchers. Of course, we should give them the opportunity and uh, uh, we should uh, recognize their efforts. So, uh, yes, and adding some challenges. So, I think in this room we all know that uh, lack of self-confidence is a common problem in uh, Central and Eastern Europe especially, and we try to address this with skill development, also lack of experience with the trainings, we also provided funding for pilot projects, and uh, also institutional changes, I have to mention it. My institution were separated from the Academy of Sciences a few years ago. And such institutional change can ruin all the things that was built up earlier. But uh, we try to address this challenge with providing internal stability to the researchers. And I think we did it well. Of course, low salaries at the Central and Eastern European region is also a problem because researchers answer with uh, multiple jobs, they get other jobs, and uh, then they suffer a lack of time. So we try to motivate them and set up rewards for their activities. So at first, skill development, just very briefly, we also try to uh, develop their publication skills with academic writing courses. We provided funding for proofreading their um, papers, uh, language skills, and also we created a funding source for co-writing with West European uh, authors, so they could visit each other for a few weeks and uh, publish a paper together. 
Also, proposal writing skills, of course, we organize trainings for that. And it's important that we also had trainings for data protections and ethics. It's, it's a growing importance, uh, made it necessary. Motivation for international publications. So how we got them to step out to the international level. We have a benchmark system which was introduced in 2012 and the researchers get points in the benchmark system for their publications, for their other activities. And of course the higher points goes for impact factor journal publications and the international publications get more points. So they changed their way of thinking and their orientation and started to publish more international publications because um, also their salaries were, are connected with the benchmark system. We set up a yearly award for the best publications and uh, Director General, the second in the row, uh, set up a publication reward. So everyone who publishes in an international journal, with impact factor of course, and highly ranked uh, um, publisher, book or book chapter, receives a reward, a certain amount of money. So. Uh, <laughs> Um, it was the researchers really liked these programs, and of course, it worked together with increasing international visibility. Quite common things, but international publications themselves increase international visibility, of course. But we also also organized conferences, workshops, and did the most common things, and we are on it too. So, so it's getting better and better. And of course, uh, we try to support international collaborations. The International Mobility Fund for conference participation is the most popular fund in the institution. And I think we hit two birds with one stone because uh, they uh, can participate in a conference with paper and the paper will be published later. And also it's a networking opportunity and they can be involved in projects. Okay, I mentioned visiting, so, uh, visiting professorships and also international consortium fund was set up uh, to uh, give funding for proposal for preparation workshops and uh, uh, funding to participate in consortium meetings. So the number of international publications increased very quickly and uh, Motivation for international proposal writing, it became a very important question because we faced that, why should I waste my time with proposal writing? I can write an article instead, I get reward. So in 2019, we introduced the reward for international proposal submitting too. And of course, in the benchmark system, they got points for submitting and even higher points for winning an international application. Okay, the research support teams that exist in our institution are very important, and I don't want to talk much about all their activities, but, uh, but it's the most important because they can help the researchers to step forward their goals. Of course, we provide the researchers assistance in almost all things that can come up, and we have great colleagues to do that, so it's important. Yes, it's pre-award, post-award phase. Uh, just to show you our successful international application activity, so we started as a consortium partner, then we tried at uh, 2017 as a consortium leader, and next uh, year, at the end of the next year, we won Demos project as a consortium leader. It was a great step for us. And also the ERC Consolidator Grant that we won in 2015, because it gave the self-confidence and we believed that we can do it. So it, it was a very important step. So it's a never-ending story. Sometimes like this, sometimes like that, but we don't give up and continue doing these things and I think we can get better. Uh, we have plans for the future, now we've set up the goal to participate not only cluster two projects but in other. Uh, so we created this expertise offer that very briefly introduces the researcher and the institution. And uh, just to wrap up, 
uh, new challenges. I, I don't want to talk about them, but of course we try to, try to do our best. Uh, most interesting thing in this slide, I think the electric um, online management system. So at the project phase, uh, uh, we introduce electric signatures to all researchers and uh, they have the opportunity to uh, all, do all administrative tasks in an online system. And I think, I think researchers, after they got used to it, they will like it very much. So, just the keywords, and thank you for your attention. Uh, yes, thank you. That was really interesting. And I like the start of, well, we haven't really done anything special. And then every slide was like something special. So <laughs> it's, it's really impressive. Um, I was interested about, uh, well, I was interested in all of it. The particular question is about the... Um, I guess perverse incentives that you talked about, which is, well, I get funding for the output, so therefore I don't need to apply for the funding. And the two things that I wanted to specifically ask about were you, you had a focus, I think, on uh, journal articles with an impact factor or in the top quartile, and I'm wondering, well, what about journals which aren't on Scopus or uh, other databases <laughs> are available. Um, and then the other question was, um, do you have any sort of gradation based on the value of the funding that which people are applying for or awarded? Does that make a difference? Yes. Uh, so, of course, of course, the second slide of the publications, I, because of the lack of time, I switched it, but that was all the international publications. So, of course, uh, you know, we, we, we made a differentiation because we started with all international publications got a reward. But after that, that we have more and more, now we give more uh, rewards for those with higher impact factor, and Q2, the quarter two, got out, but before that, it also received rewards. So uh, we try to push the researchers to, to try to get um, higher goals. And uh, the other question is, uh, yes, of course, we differentiate. I think I skipped that uh, <laughs> slide very quickly, but the ERC grants, of course, MSCA grants, and uh, those applications that are submitted uh, as a consortium leader got higher rewards. And uh, being as a partner is not enough to get this reward. We require uh, uh, that uh, they should be work package leaders in that project. And the most important thing that we have a process how an international uh, application can be submitted and there is a quality check between them because I know that if they want to get the money oh we submit like something and we don't care we get the money no so they have to uh, follow the steps and of course there is a quality check by the colleagues <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is Dragana, and I'm also coming from University of Banja Luka. Um, my question is referred to the second slide uh, with regards to increase of uh, scientific, I assume, articles, publications. Uh, did you make any analysis? What is the cause of such increase? I mean, is it due to investment for research equipment uh, or... Um, persuasion <laughs> to researchers to perform more research or something else? Well, uh, I think I think all these things cause this um, this increase. So uh, mainly, I, I I think research support is very important, uh, and also that the the researchers who won as a consortium leader they tried it uh, multiple times, and also they started the preparation very early. So the DEMOS project uh, won, but uh, even when, when you, you know, you can, you can um, I don't know, when, when these uh, draft uh, calls are circulated and you can contribute, even that time they contributed. So, so it wasn't, the call wasn't announced at all when we know about that and they started the preparation. So, so I think, I think these are the most important factors. And the good research support. So I think we picked persons from the CU, Central European University, and uh, they were also scientists too, and I think they, they were capable of giving them really good support. So I think it's important. Thank you. 
So um, without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Magdalena Bemandrievska from the National Center for Research Devel and Development on how to build effective support on the path towards, in, towards Horizon Europe experience of national contact point in Poland. Uh, okay, so uh, good afternoon everyone. Uh, it's true, my name is Magdalena Bemandrievska. Uh, I'm director of the National Contact Point uh, for Poland. Uh, our host institution is the National Center for Research and uh, Development. Uh, and here comes the first slide. Uh, it's not only a nice picture, uh, the future is happening here is actually uh, the motto of our host uh, organization, so I just uh, uh, put it in my slide. But um, in this picture, <coughs> uh, you may recognize the, uh, the building in the very center of, uh, of it. Uh, it is actually the Palace of Culture, uh, quite recognizable. Uh, building uh, in Warsaw. But what's important is, uh, uh, in this picture is uh, actually the building in the uh, foreground uh, of the slide um, on, uh, on my left. Uh, it is the highest building of the European Union. And uh, the National Center for Research and Development is moving to this building uh, this summer. So, uh, we are quite excited uh, about it. It's quite symbolic, isn't it, for, for an organization uh, in the very center of um, uh, European uh, um, uh, initiatives. Uh, but uh, it is uh, quite a challenge. Um, <clears throat> the uh, NCP department uh, moved to uh, National Center for Research and Development uh, in November 2020. And uh, at this moment, I, I was appointed uh, its director uh, after 20 years in the Ministry of Science and Higher Education uh, with a mission to, uh, of course, reinvent, uh, rethink, uh, to bring some new energy uh, to, uh, to NCP organization um, uh, and to benefit from this, uh, uh, to benefit from the, all the opportunities that uh, uh, we um, could obtain thanks to um, uh, becoming uh, part of this huge agency. As my colleague um, uh, said, uh, the largest uh, R&D funding uh, agency in Central uh, Europe, uh, about 900 uh, employees um, uh, right now. Um, in the NCP department, we are a team of uh, more than 40 people, uh, soon uh, I hope 50. Uh, of course, uh, we do uh, what uh, all similar organizations uh, um, uh, do. Uh, we support the participation of Polish research organizations, enterprises and other entities in the Horizon Europe Framework program. Of course, we promote spread information, deliver training and networking events. We negotiate rules and procedures uh, taking part in the um, uh, program committees of the Horizon uh, Europe program. We cooperate closely and directly uh, with the um, uh, European Commission, other EU institutions, uh, member states, associated states, Polish governmental partners, and of course potential and actual beneficiaries of uh, EU framework programs. Uh, and uh, what more is, and I will develop um, this, um, um, uh, this, uh, this point, we are uh, really in the core of the Polish support system. Uh, we are not alone, we are um, among um, colleagues. Um, we also develop synergies and co-design our national funding system for the forthcoming years. It is important, but it's not going to be the, really the subject of, of today's presentation. Here's the landscape of um, of Polish research system. It is just to, to show you how it, uh, um, how it works. Uh, 
uh, in our everyday um, uh, work. <laughs> Uh, the Ministry of Education Science is our supervising authority. Then you can see in the center, National Center for Research and Development, Office of International Cooperation, and with, uh, in this office, three departments, the NCP, depart NCP, depart NCP Department, International Cooperation Department, and small but dynamic uh, office in uh, Brussels. Uh, what you can observe here is th that uh, there is also uh, a network of horizontal contact points. Uh, our mission uh, connecting to reinvention of the, our activities uh, was connected also with the reinvention of the national uh, system of uh, support. Um, we were asked by the Ministry to analyze and propose uh, a new model of regional support. Uh, there used to be a dozen, uh, um, well the number was not stable, but uh, more or less a dozen of regional contact points. Um, uh, and uh, after a thorough analysis, uh, we uh, proposed to the Ministry last year um, and, um, well, a kind of reform. Uh, we propose to cut the number of um, uh, regional contact points by half. And um, um, we had the chance to, uh, not only to, to get the, the approval of the ministry, but also um, uh, the system uh, has changed because uh, um, in the past, uh, this network was uh, financed directly by the Ministry. So even uh, if we were to uh, coordinate the, the, this network, uh, we in fact didn't have uh, tools. Now we are uh, the uh, supervising authority of this network. Uh, we finance them, we coordinate them, and now we are developing um, uh, the whole uh, implementing and developing the whole system. Uh, here is uh, a map. Uh, you can see six so-called ma macro regions. Fortunately, the map is in Polish, but I think you can roughly guess um, uh, the, the, the logic uh, uh, of this uh, division. Uh, however, it's not it's not all, uh, because uh, while executing this particular exercise, we um, understood that even an important restructuring wouldn't solve all the problems. Uh, as you probably know, the biggest, uh, in my opinion, the biggest challenge uh, in Horizon Europe uh, consists of uh, about 50 European uh, partnerships huge initiatives demanding an impressive mobilization and determination while the industry sector is not at, at the same level of maturity uh, simply um, uh, as uh, in um, uh, the old European uh, member states. That is why we suggested to create thematic contact points also. Uh, very timidly we proposed that to, to, to our ministry and, uh, well, luckily the Ministry approved this concept also. Um, and uh, at simultaneously, uh, the, the second network uh, was uh, set up. Uh, this time we are not the direct uh, funder. Uh, the, uh, we, we couldn't operate the, um, uh, this uh, uh, process because, uh, well, it was... Uh, um, impossible from the legal point of view, uh, because this time this, uh, the contest was not uh, open. It was limited to, uh, to a network of chosen uh, research institutes. So um, the agency that we are uh, couldn't operate this, uh, uh, this um, uh, process. Um, okay, so uh, um, to, uh, to sum up this part of my speech, uh, I can say that uh, 
we are actually very involved in the training of this uh, second network. We are building our cooperation and the and the system of this first network of horizontal contact points. Uh, and uh, I must say that it's quite a success to, to, um, to implement uh, this, the, this big and national reform, cross-cutting reform, in about six or seven months, maybe. Um, um, so we, we've got these fantastic, I would say, resources, and uh, I hope that... Uh, uh, in, a, in a few months and weeks. Very soon we will see the first effects of this change. Um, let me just uh, say um, a few more words. Um, uh, I, I can see that we are running out of time, but um, uh, I would like to stress this. It is only a framework. Of course, it was important to do so, but uh, uh, now um, we have to um, complement this framework with some substantial uh, offer. And um, uh, probably uh, you will um, uh, get all the presentations afterwards, so uh, you'll be able to discover uh, some flag flagship initiatives that uh, I have put in my uh, slides. To, to, to illustrate um, what was just said. Um, I hope it can be um, interesting for you that uh, we have started uh, to, to shape our support by choosing some, by, of course, by analyzing and then choosing some um, uh, adjectives, some characteristics that uh, simply must uh, be uh, present must be incorporated in all our initiatives. Uh, we will get my presentation, so um, you will uh, you will able to you will be able to uh, to find uh, some illustration for what was just said. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for a nice presentation. Uh, my name is Ian Anderson from uh, University of Southern Denmark. Uh, I also come from a small country where the NCP role is very close to end users. Uh, I know that in some countries the NCP function is very, very far away from day-to-day -day work uh, on the ground in universities and research organizations. So to what degree do you build on best practices and uh, different ways of doing things across uh, countries and across the networks of uh, NCPs? Um, uh, if I understand you well, uh, that's uh, why we have also the uh, regional or if now micro, macro regional uh, system of support because uh, all our uh, horizontal contact points, uh, well now called horizontal before it was uh, regional, um, uh, are based uh, in, um, uh, in the premises of uh, research institu institutions uh, in universities or research institutes. So uh, they are much closer, for example, that we are, and we, uh, we are in constant um, uh, discussion. Uh, we are also, as uh, I put uh, all these adjectives here, we are very open. I mean, you know, everyone can come and propose a type of uh, training and a, a, a topic for training that is needed. And I think uh, it's our, um, uh, it's our it, it, it seems a good way, you know, to, to respond really to the needs of the um, uh, of our stakeholders. It was also a question about whether you are collaborating across countries, uh, across borders in Europe uh, with other NCPs to learn mm -hmm. from how they do it in, in yeah, other certainly. countries. And, yeah. Certainly. Um, uh, well, there are um, uh, maybe, you know, uh, special uh, projects, uh, special grants for NPC organizations. It, th they are um, uh, only for NCP organizations. Uh, and we uh, currently are um, entering in uh, about 10 
projects in the, because the, the framework program uh, has just started last year, so uh, it is the first uh, wave. Uh, and we are, uh, as Poland, we are a uh, Polish N NCP department, we coordinate also uh, one huge um, project of this type with about 30 um, organizations in, uh, in the consortium. It was great hearing about the national level of support, but now we would like to hear more from Tomasz Dudas. Uh, from the Pan-European University on building research support at a private university in, so in Slovakia, the challenges and opportunities. Okay, I'm from the Pan-European University from Slovakia. Uh, I'm in uh, uh, university administration. I'm dean of the faculty of economics and entrepreneurship. And uh, yeah, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about the challenges for smaller private universities in, in building research support and, and getting results in this area. Okay, um, just to give you a landscape about the S Slovak universities, uh, that uh, most of the students, as you can see, study at public universities and state universities. That's basically the same. And uh, there are 10 private universities, which are typically smaller. Uh, you can see that we have less than 2,000 students and we are the second largest private university at this point. And they are typically newer. They were established in the early 2000s. Um, so even the oldest ones are barely 20 years old. And as for financing, uh, they do not get any kind of uh, state support. So they, we just live from the, from the tuition fees and, and uh, yeah, without without public, public funding. And so our faculty is one of the faculties of the Pan-European University. Uh, we have five faculties, law, media, psychology, and, and informatics, and of course, economics and entrepreneurship. Um, yeah, we have study programs in all three levels of uh, university education up to the PhD level. And uh, I have to emphasize that we are really small. Uh, also as, as far as faculty members go. So you can see that where the challenges could come from that. So we have only, I think, 14 full-time faculty members at our faculty, plus we have up to 15. It changes um, part-time collaborators who, who teach uh, some courses. So you can see that really the material we have to work with is, is really, uh, really limited let's say, um, but you know, if you come from universities, I think in any countries, uh, the publish or perish imperative is well and alive everywhere, uh, also in Slovakia, because if you want to get accredited by the accreditation agency, the number of the scientific publication is of course one of the key criteria, and the number of the research projects that you received and successfully finished is another. And of course, the, the amount of the grant money you, you received is another very important criteria. So yeah, you have to, you have to be successful also in the grant uh, research grant area because without that, you will have problems with, with your uh, accreditation. Uh, what kind of funding uh, we have available? Uh, we have the national level. Every country, I think you know that, has some kind of, of schemes. Um, we have some very peculiar uh, standards in, in Slovakia, let's say. There are two schemes, the Vega and the Kega, scientific and, and, and more of pedag pedagogic scheme, which is open to private universities. Uh, you, can, you can get a, a project, uh, but you don't get money. From, from the government. So, so yes, the government agency tells you, yes, your project is very high quality, you can do that, but we are terribly sorry, you have to finance it yourself. That's it. Which is a fun thing uh, to, to do. Uh, myself have a project with zero financing, but yeah, that's, that's how we live. Uh, then we have another scheme, uh, the APVV scheme. It's a bigger scale scheme which uh, it has a fiercer competition, so it's harder to, harder to, to obtain. 
and uh, I think that they have a bias against against uh, uh, private universities because if you look at the share of the grants proposed and and uh, the successful projects. Um, I think that, that there is a clear, clear bias. Okay, you can say that the projects of private universities are uh, lower quality, but yeah, it's debatable. Uh, anyways, okay, so that's what you have on the national level, and of course you have the international level. Uh, we had well, quite good success with the Visegrad Fund in the past. We run several projects with partner universities from the Visegrad regions. Uh, nowadays we have, I think, two Erasmus Plus uh, projects. Uh, that, that the f we take part also in, in typically a Visegrad, Visegrad uh, cooperation. And of course the big projects are out of our reach. Uh, Horizon Europe is, is a science fiction, unfortunately, I would say, uh, with our current, current capabilities and, and possibilities. Uh, okay, so, so that's what, what we have, and okay, what are the key challenges and limitations that we have? Well, we, I spoke already about the size of the faculty, so the number of people is, is really limited, so we are talking 14 full-time faculty members, so it's quite hard to build teams because these 14 people uh, uh, don't work in the same f uh, field of research, they don't have the same research interests, so uh, it's even problematic to put together a small team, for example, for, for a smaller schemes, for the national schemes. So that's, that's obviously uh, one challenge. And other challenge, which of course correlates with the, with the topic of this, this whole uh, conference, that uh, we have a very limited administrative support, I would say very close to none. Uh, so we, at the faculty level, there, we used to have one, a person, but um, this position was cut and was never re-established. Re and I, there is a vice rector for uh, research at the university level, but I think his staff also includes only one person, so it's it's not much to to work with. So that's that. What that really means that uh, what we heard about in several presentations that the researchers have to do. Most, most of the administrative support. They have to study the grant proposals, they have to write the grants themselves, they have to build know-how, and of course, if they get the grant, then they have to do most of the administration stuff, which uh, we know that it, it cuts to your research time, and besides, you, you have to do teaching and other, other things, so, yeah. It, it, it puts an additional pressure on the on the faculty members, and uh, I, I would add maybe one one more thing that um, as a private university, um, as a small unit, it's it's harder to find uh, project partners, uh, especially in Western Europe. In Central Europe, we already established uh, we have some some partners that we. We did already some projects. So if you once established the contact and you created this, this human, human touch and, and there is some past success, then it's, uh, it's easier to build up on it. And, uh, and typically we move, move forward with, with other projects with the same collaborating partners, but it's not easy to get new, new research partners outside of Slovakia. Uh, so Having in mind this, uh, what can be done and what are the possibilities, I would say, for, for improving the, the situation in the area of research support? Of course, uh, key, key thing, number one that comes into the mind is to, to establish a project office, at, the, at least at the university level, that we should have a, a project management and, and administration office that would uh, alleviate some of the some of the pressure that comes on on the faculty members uh, there are talks of this but as of this point well, it's still uh, I think in, in the future um, the second thing um, I think what is a problem that the faculties do not cooperate that much all of the faculties are, are similarly smaller of size maybe the low faculty is a bigger one 
in terms of, of faculties, and, but I can see that there could be synergies between, between the faculties. So, um, for example, business and informatics go, go together and we already started to build some cooperation with our colleagues at the Faculty of Informatics, but I think also in the future faculty uh, of, of law and, and economics could also get the results or even um, law and psych uh, economics and psychology, business and psychology could be interesting in context of behavioral, behavioral economy and, and uh, these areas. So this is something that we need to improve. And uh, I forgot to mention that uh, we as a private university belong to a, a, a Czech business group uh, that has a wide interests. So not only universities, but they are present in, in many fields of business. And they also uh, own several universities, two Czech universities and, and our university. So um, one of the roles that, uh, that already we are going, going on, that we are strengthening the contact with our Czech colleagues. So they are, they are also undergoing a transition now. These two schools are going to mer merge into one and they are going also to be called a pan-European university in Czech Republic. So uh, yeah, with, with this cooperation, I, I think uh, we could be stronger and uh, we, can also sh we could share also the administrative burden and, and be more successful, especially in, in uh, European uh, project uh, grant schemes. And maybe, as, I think in the long-term solution is to the last point is to um, somehow persuade the, the owners to, to take on more faculty members to strengthen the numbers of, the, of our faculty. But of course, uh, it is closely linked with the number of students. They would say that if you get more students, then you get more faculty, faculty members. So it's, it's a very uh, hard thing to do. But I think that's, that's uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's the only thing to do to improve also our uh, research capabilities. So yeah, that would be all from, from me. Um, thank you very much for attention. Uh, thanks. This might well be your question as well, Angelo, because we kind of looked at each other. Um, you said, I think Horizon Europe, did you call it a dream? I'm, never, I'm not sure I've ever heard it described like that before. Science but, fiction? Yeah, or... science fiction, something like that. Um, so, but why? I mean, it's a small institution, sure, but I mean, companies of 10 people apply. Maybe not as coordinator, but... Well, uh... If I look at the, the, the research capabilities that are available and the research support available, uh, I don't see really uh, that we, we could pull off. Of course, not as coordinators, but as, as members. Um, so, but uh, maybe also I, it's a problem of that we are not confident enough. Maybe we could. Maybe maybe we could pull, pull it off, but uh, one other thing that we probably have to do is to maybe motivate more the colleagues, so they are more content with the, the grant schemes they know, and um, and uh, they are not not that big fans of trying some very uh, big fancy ideas. And we are moving to the last, but not the least, presentation. It's kind of like at the cherry on the top of the cream. Natasha jakominic marot from the University of Rijeka, who will talk about leadership skills. Good thing after this. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I have to tell you, I've never delivered a presentation on leadership in 15 minutes. But I know you're looking forward to the coffee. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's always a first time. So um, my colleagues, especially in the plenary, has, have already told us so much that we already know about our RMA profession, which is 
uh, not a recognized profession. This is why uh, I think it's really important to talk about another aspect as well. And I see in all of these leadership conferences and all of these uh, RMA conferences, we have uh, very enthusiastic people who love their jobs. So what I really think we, we should also talk about another aspect of the profession, which is the changing uh, job. So it is very motivating because you never do the same things. It cannot be boring in any way. But also, I've been in this profession for 20 years and I've de developed, let's say, from an institution where I could relate to what Thomas was just saying. 20 years ago, we didn't have any research support and now we have quite a substantial office and quite, uh, quite research support. Of course, we could do better, we all can. But I think it's really important to talk about leadership. So I will not deliver a presentation on leadership, but I will try to tell you why it's important to lead yourself and anybody who can follow your lead, whether formally or informally. So it will be a very short presentation, if I can switch slides. Uh, what, yeah, especially. Uh, what I would also like to tell you is um, many of you or many of us have been in the position of being, let's say, only research management administrators. And sometime during our path, we develop into some kind of managers, leader, office heads, or whatever we are. And our competencies are different. The required competencies are very different from, let's say, the, the, the technical part we need to know as research managers. But also, uh, later on, as high as we go uh, in our careers, let's say, we need some other competencies which become, if not equally, even more important, I would say. So what I will very shortly try to introduce you to is give you, give you the difference between managing and leading, because I think it's a very substantial difference, and it's really important to understand the difference. And I will try to focus on what I think is really important for research and management administration profession, which is uh, the difference between self-leadership and team leadership. I think it's really important. And also, since I'm used to giving workshops and not really lectures on, on <laughs> leadership, I will try to motivate you and give you some hints on what you can do immediately after we finish here or when you go to sleep or in a few days. You can really do something to motivate yourselves uh, to become a better person and to go towards your goals. So, uh, as you see, my uh, goals are really ambitious in the 15 minutes I have. Uh, so let's just start with the definition, not because I think it's important uh, that you learn the definition, but I want to give a point here. So uh, one of the definitions I really like is is this one, because it says, leadership is the ability of an individual or a group of individuals to influence and guide followers or other members of an organization. So what we can see in this definition is two really strong words. One is influence and another one is guide. So both words are not really boring. <laughs> they're really motivating, they're really important. So also uh, to give you um, a hint of what I meant when I said that management and leadership are two very different concepts. I have found uh, two, let's say, definitions. It was in a talk from uh, two professors of Harvard Business School, um, which I think really well illustrate how, for example, it's really difficult sometimes to be a head or to be responsible for research managers, especially if you have no experience, because it's a job that, as we said, it's, a, it's an unrecognized profession, uh, which really sometimes is hard to grasp and explain to anybody else. So uh, one of the professors, Professor John Fuller said, management is getting the confused, misguided, unmotivated and misdirected person to accomplish a common purpose on a regular recurring basis. So we can see what he says, it's basically, let's say, task-oriented. So let's have somebody do something. So you just say, please go and do this, and preferably I will also tell you how to do that. We can't really do that in research management, even though we call it research management. So another professor, Professor Nancy Cohen, on leadership, she said, leadership is the creation of positive non-incremental change, the empowerment of people to make the vision happen despite obstacles, and the creation of a coalition of energy and momentum that can move the change forward. So again, as the leadership definition, you can hear some really motivating words here, but what is really important to understand here is that 
We are mentioning people. We are mentioning the vision, motivation, moving forward, and so on. So let's say that management is telling somebody to go and do something, when in, in leadership, we go and do that together. So management focuses on systems and structures, which of course are important. I'm not really uh, trying to diminish the importance of management, but leadership actually focuses on people, of course, having all, always the regard on what we have to accomplish, because it's important to do something and accomplish that. So um, leadership definitions are multiple, and there are, there are so many ways to, let's say, define or, or group uh, leadership, but let's say that the basic ones could be self-leadership, team leadership, and organizational leadership. And in my opinion, what we should focus today is the first two, so self-leadership and team leadership. Uh, let's say I already told you, um, or you can already understand some of the differences that I'm, from what I said before. But uh, it's really important to understand that self-leadership and leadership are not necessarily linked. So you can be good at one and not necessarily at another, but they do go hand in hand. So self-leadership basically means uh, to lead oneself. It's quite understandable. While team leadership means to lead other people. In research management, it's often a project teams. You are a project manager or a work package manager. There is a team you have to lead towards performing a certain task. Sometimes it's also leading office employees or whoever you are supposed to lead in either formal or informal settings. So self-leadership, I really like this uh, Lao Tzu's uh, quotes <laughs> which are put here, which says, mastering others is strength, but mastering yourself is true power. And I think you can really all agree uh, this is really true. So uh, going into, uh, into self-leadership, uh, I don't know why it didn't go, it doesn't matter. Um, Self-leadership should be something you should really focus on. So I feel young, uh, but uh, some biologists would say I'm middle-aged. But still, I think <laughs> I haven't achieved the, m most of my goals in life. I think I'm okay with what I do, but I always have something to strive towards. And I think if you're motivated, it's easier to motivate other people as well. This is why I said that self-leadership and leadership are not necessarily linked, but it's easier to motivate other people or to lead other people if you are motivated yourself. So I hope you would not like to go to work looking like the person in the first picture. I think it's wonderful, and our job as research management managers really allows to wake up in the morning really happy, looking forward to the challenges that await us uh, in that day. Uh, I've put on this slide some of the, let's say, skills or the description of, of, of personal traits uh, which could be associated to being a happy person or this could be also translated to goals or however we want to look at that. I will not go through that. Uh, what I wanted to uh, give here is give you the positivity of different fields you can work on, either yourself or uh, having your team or whoever you are supposed to lead work towards that. So we all have our own different goals and visions and, and needs and desires and of course we are all different people. This is why we cannot apply, uh, there is no recipe for, for applicable to all people. So what can we do and how do you improve our, improve our leadership skills? First, we have to get to know ourselves. So it's really important to be honest towards yourself, and I'm sure if you think about it, it's sometimes easier to lead other people than to really sit and work on ourselves, improving our skills and really making something done. We always find some kind of excuses not to do that. So it's important to define the purpose of your life, the vision, uh, your core values, your unique strengths, and link to that also your weaknesses because this is something you can work on. We shouldn't be too ambitious and try to fix everything or change everything. Let's just go step by step. It's also, also important to understand what are the environments, the surroundings in which we really feel comfortable, in, for which we really like to be in. And also it's important to define what our personal definition of success is. So it's really important because we have to be honest towards ourselves. Um, in order to succeed in whatever we think is success in life is. 
So I think it's important to learn how to lead yourself before, before you can do that to other people. So um, in, in motivational and active um, goals, let's say, that, that I already mentioned, um, how to lead yourself is uh, defined by these six uh, active verbs. Uh, let's say we have to be aware of our strengths and weaknesses, we have to set goals, it's really important. We also have to keep track of how, or, or, uh, how we do or don't realize our goals, we have to adapt them. That is really important because we should not stick to something that is not working, we, ha we have to try other paths and so on. We have to lead ourselves to fulfillment. We have to make what is important a priority. And prioritizing, I think, is one of the skills which we, sh we should all really master as soon as possible. So as far as team leadership is uh, concerned, and I have not put much emphasis on this because I think um, some of us, let's say, or some of you already have a natural talent to lead people, but this is a skill. It can be mastered and it's really good news. So uh, what is important to know and what I really wanted to convey today is that um, you cannot lead um, all people in the same way. You have to adapt to different things, to a situation, to personal traits of people you should uh, motivate or lead and uh, to skills. So there are different leadership styles. There's a theory, but I think you can naturally feel also if, you, if you're a parent, if you have children, to get the same thing, you will never have the same approach because they're simply very different. So what is important also for our job is the jobs are changing. It's ever more complex and this is why it's becoming more and more important to have leaders in the right positions because teamwork has become very, very complex today. So what team leaders should take care of is person, team and also work and you should never forget that, I mean, you're there to do something. Uh, so it's really important, besides for you doing your own self-assessment, I'm sure you have people you trust. It doesn't necessarily mean these people are those who always say, say something positive about you, but if you feel there's some objective person around you, ask for feedback on any fields where you could or could not improve. Uh, what I also, one of the last messages I want to tell you is that you should be proactive. So there's, there's so many things that worry us. There's a war in Ukraine, uh, there's uh, the COVID situation, there's a, the economic crisis somewhere, but it's not something we can influence. So let's not worry about that. Let's try to find ways to influence what we really can, and it's our attitudes, what we can do, our enthusiasm, our, our habits, and the people around us for which we can make a huge difference. So we can always find excuses and say it's somebody else's fault, but it's not really a leadership trait. It's not something that will make any difference in our lives. There is so much we can do and our lives should be something that we take care of and take responsibility for. So for homework, uh, I have a very easy task for you. <laughs> so uh, I would like you, if you're interested in improving yourselves, to pick one leadership behavior or one skill or one trait uh, you would like to improve. Also to pick one you would like to maintain. And what is really uh, maybe the most difficult one, uh, pick one uh, leadership uh, behavior which you would like to reduce or change. So it's something you can do today or tomorrow or in really short term which can really change and make you feel better about yourself. So that, that was my very short presentation in 15 minutes, so I think it's a record in leadership. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Any questions? So thank you very much for your inspiring presentation. <laughs> I will just want to ask, so management is more about the control, actually. Let's say, or it's yeah. more task focused. Yeah. Because I'm a master in management, so I know <laughs> all these theories and what is the differences between the management and the leadership. 
But I would like to ask one practical question. How to maintain self-control and also the control of the team when you want to inspire them, but still want to get the deadlines and all those boring reports? It's a great question. I'd probably have a Nobel Prize if I could give a <laughs> concrete answer to that. But I mean, it's a con constant struggle. But yes, of course, you have to keep the deadlines. But I mean, there's a huge amount of theory on management and experiences and research, and it's really important, and I think it's one of the most important things you have to master is saying no. Because sometimes it's really difficult for us to have ways of saying no and we have to do that. Especially if you're somewhere high in the hierarchy, you have these people who have their own goals, you have the management who, which has their own goals and you have to try to balance all that all the time. So I would say learn how to say no, that could be helpful, but I believe it's, it's a difficult task. So if there are no other questions, thank you. Thank you.